Um, he will talk us about a project he has worked on during his PhD at Delft University. Bastian? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, please do tell if I'm not um, audible enough or something. And um, always feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, so my name is Bastian Passe, and uh, the work has been done during my PhD at Delft. And um, I had two collaborators, mainly Tita Micha, my supervisor, and also Carol de Vriend, who's here, um, who was uh, working with me on one paper here. Um, and the title of the talk is Epidemics on Networks from Complicated Structures to Simple Dynamics. Okay. So um, the main question that we want to, we want to face here is uh, how does a virus spread? And um, we have here a very simplified picture of uh, a crowd of people who are connected by some, some lines. And um, these lines indicate here that the virus may travel between these two people. Um, so in a way, this is uh, the pathway of a virus. And um, you could imagine that these, these lines could indicate that people are friends, that they're in contact, maybe they're shaking their hands. Or they just cough at each other. Um, and as a contact network now, we describe the whole set of all black links basically. Um, so we have some specification of all links in the population. Um, but the major problem that we have is that these contact networks are complicated. We have uh, well, zoomed out a bit on the, on the global scale. Um, we see a lot of links, a lot of connections. So that would basically be the path the virus takes from to go well from a variant, um, newly variant, um, an area where the variant emerges, and there's a flight to another continent, and then the virus is there. Um, and these real contact networks are large and unknown, and it makes it very complicated to predict epidemics on these networks. That's the outline. Um, we we'll start with, well, probably to the audience here, quite a known fact on complex networks. And then I introduced the, the model, the SIS model on networks um, that also many of you may know. And the last three bullet points, I think these are the novel parts. Let's start um, with some basic notation. So we have here a network with four nodes, um, capital N is the number of nodes, capital N, L is the number of links. Um, and all well, the numbers are just like nodes. We can omit them later on. And nodes correspond to, for example, airports and links to flight routes. So if we consider the example that we've seen before, the map of global flight routes. And um, we can represent this network quite compactly as an adjacency matrix, which has the number of nodes as columns and the number of nodes as rows. And um, a one or a zero indicates the, the presence or the absence of links. And lastly, there's, there's, there are many, many metrics that you can find on these networks. And for this talk, it's fine to just look at the degree. This is the number of outgoing links on a node. So we see, for example, node three has one outgoing link, node one has three outgoing links. Um, so far to the basic notation. And then I want to focus on one network here to talk. There are many complicated networks, but um, for this talk, I will by about the Albert network. And um, here you have an illustration of um, the Barabasi Albert network with 1,000 nodes. You see here these, these cups in the middle. The, the size corresponds to, to the degree of the node. So these are very high degree nodes in the center. And then the periphery, you have quite small nodes, quite, quite small circles. So they only have one or two connections. So it's a very heterogeneous network. And um, if we were to plot the distribution of that network, the, the, the degree distribution. So um, capital D is the degree of a randomly chosen node from the network. And um, here we have the distribution of that degree. And if we plot that on a block lock scale, we see that the well, empirical distribution, the, the crosses that they roughly follow a power line, for, a power line curve, um, so it's very heterogeneous. And um, yeah, 
that's the key observation here. We have a few nodes with very, very um, many connections. And well, that's a seminal paper that all of you may know. Um, but I think it's nice to repeat it in this context here. Um, now, Razi Albert uh, and Albert they found that many real world networks um, follow that degree distribution. So we have here in the panels A, B, C, the same block blocks that I talked about before, but for actual networks. So for an active collaboration network for the World Wide Web and the power of this. And um, I added here on the right also uh, another network um, that's a web of human sexual contacts. And you see that this also behaves um, according to a power law. You can imagine if, um, an, if an STD breaks out there, that this behaves very differently than on a, on a homogeneous network. And um, yeah, we, we cannot capture this whole distribution by only the mean degree. And um, this is more of a note. There's also a mechanistic explanation to, to this um, observed power law behavior. Yeah, and basically what we want to, want to understand now, so we have a complicated network like this. How can we describe an epidemic in those? Um, there are many papers facing these questions from different angles. And um, I want to add to that. Um, and here we focus on the FAS epidemics and network. Um, here we have a very stylized uh, version of the contact graph with five nodes. And nodes can now represent individuals or groups of individuals. And links indicate transmission relevant contacts. So it could be friendships or regular contacts. And um, I hope that in the animation works. So we have on the top right, there's one node that's infected. And um, yeah, the infection can spread now via the links by the contacts um, and affect other nodes in the graph. And nodes can cure independently. And um, so you can, in the end, see an epidemic unfolding on that contact graph. And as we've seen before, the contact graph is very heterogeneous. Um, in our setting, it means we have uh, looking at that uh, as an application that can be isolated individuals or Cluster communities, maybe um, sport clubs or something, and super spreaders, maybe people who have a lot of parties, and um, they contribute a lot to the spread. Um, one distinction I would like to make before diving into the formulas um, we have basically a distinction between individual based and group based understanding of these equations. With um, on the left, individual based, where nodes can represent single individuals. So here, um, small people representing that. Or on the right, you have um, a node can represent a whole household um, or maybe a whole city, depending on the resolution you would like to have. And um, then links also mean something else. So on the left, you have friendships, colleagues, sexual partners, and so forth. And on the right, you have streets, highways, flight routes, or any other connection between this um, meta population. Um, and most importantly, here is now that the virus state. So we will associate the virus state with each of the nodes. Um, an II of T on the left side means, or it's interpreted as a probability that an individual is infected at time T, whereas on the right, we, more, we would rather interpret it as a fraction of infected individuals in a given group. Um, okay, with that remark, we go to the actual governing equations. Um, I also put them here on the, on the whiteboard um, because we will come back to that quite often. Um, and we have here now a contact graph again labeled one to three and um, directed links. So you see that the link from one to two is labeled by beta two one, and the link from two to one labeled by beta one two. And um, that's the infection rate. So the capacity of node J to infect node I. And compactly, you can also represent that as an infection rate matrix, um, just very similar to the adjacent matrix. Um, the second ingredient that we need is the curing rate. So um, capacity of a node to cure. Um, and that's positive for every node. 
And um, yeah, then we obtain these W equations. So we have now um, the derivative of the biostate. So the change of the probability um, to be infected is composed of two terms. Um, yeah. So on the one hand, we have the Turing curve, which is minus delta i times i of t. And um, delta i is positive, i of t is also between zero and one. So the Turing term is negative and pushes basically the i of t towards zero, um, intuitively speaking, at least. But then we have the second term, um, infection term. Um, and that's now, uh, well, basically one minus i of t is the probability of an individual to be healthy. And the sum, is taking over all neighbors of no i. So here we sum over all neighbors j um, and obtain the force of infection. That's the um, yeah the force that drives i of t towards one. Um, and you see that this is a fully deterministic model. Um, you can obtain this also from the stochastic Markov chain description of an FIS process, but um, here it's the starting point of of the analysis. Okay, um, yeah, we need some more concepts to understand these equations. On the one hand, um, I will define the next generation matrix. Um, so you see we have the elements beta ij divided by delta i, and um, we can write that compactly as diag of one over delta i as infection rate matrix. Um, so diag is a diagonal matrix with with the vector on the diagonal. And um, for the SIS model now, the basic reproduction number equals the largest eigenvalue of that matrix. And um, it's a very crucial quantity in epidemics. Um, yeah. Mainly it determines how likely the, um, the epidemic is to spread. And the basic, uh, basic, uh, Connection to the during um, infection rate is that if you increase the infection rate, this will, on average, result in an increase of R0. If you increase the curing rates, it uh, will decrease R0. Um, and most importantly, R0, um, this is an epidemic threshold criterion. If R0 is smaller than or equal to one, the virus dies out, so I have to convert it to zero. On the other hand, if it's larger than one, and the virus is endemic and I of T converges to some steady state. Um, and I do know that it's I infinite. Um, yeah, but the COVID pandemic, of course, we have, uh, I think the public got very used to R not or RT even. Um, and this is here very well defined what it does to the um, differential equations. Um, yeah. The last slide on the SIS. Um, so that's model. Um, some example of how or not relates to the virus state. So I plot here for a um, network of three nodes that plot the three virus states. And you see they start somewhere small and they converge to I infinity. And um, this plot is now for R0 equals two. Um, one basic fact if we decrease R0 to be 1.1, you see that the virus state. Um, is smaller or well, it's at least a steady state. Um, yeah, you have to look at the, the y-axis, it's only ranging until 0 0.1. And if I'm not a smaller than one, then we go to zero. So there are two facts that we can read from R0. If it's how, how large it is above one, that indicates that the um, steady state side, and if it's smaller than one, then the virus dies up. Um, it's a coarse and um, qualitative description of the epi epidemic because if I tell you R0 is equal to two, equal to two, it still somehow blurs the, uh, the the picture of how the steady state is distributed um, in the different nodes. Yeah, so far so good. Um, now I want to move to education modes, um, which is a bit different way of looking into the dynamics. Of that system. Okay. Um, 
So first we rewrite the JS epidemic. Uh, nothing has happened here other than uh, I basically stack these equations for all nodes. So I of t is a vector. And again, we make use of the diagonal description and um, yeah, and we introduce u, which is all one vector. So diag u minus i of t has one minus i of t um, on the diagonal. Is that clear, Brittany? And um, now for this setting, for this setting, the challenges are that the context networks are very large. So n can be very large. We have a very large bio state vector. And second, um, the structures are heterogeneous. So um, this infection rate matrix may be very complicated. And the infection rates may also be unknown or just partially known. And yeah, it's, it's a huge complication. Yeah. So <clears throat> the only place where the particular disease comes into play is in the beta IJ. Uh, estimating those is where anything about the disease itself is located. Yes, exactly. Um, but this is a very simplified model of a disease yeah. because you only have two departments. Um, ideally, one would have SEIR for disease progressions, but yeah, it would only come into the IJ. Um, and the key idea that we want to explore in this section is that we can describe these the set of uh, differential equations by much fewer equations. So we have n differential equations, but we don't want to go to n, some number that's much smaller. Um, and to start with the motivation, um, consider a path graph now with three nodes. And um, for simplicity, we assume that the curing rates are the same. So delta i is the same for every node. And also the infection rates are either beta or zero. And yeah, now um, if you look at the SAS equations, they would be, uh, they, they become this. Um, so basically, note the, the first the first row is a SAS equation for node one and three. And it's the same because the only neighbor of node one and node three is node two. Um, I have a second equation here for uh, for second node. Um, loosely speaking, node one and node three have an equivalent position in the graph. Um, as a consequence, now because they're described by the same governing equation. <laughs> If you start at I1 equals I3, then I1 will equal I3 at all times that are um, positive. And um, I think it's helpful to have a geometric picture of that. You can now define two scalar functions, C1 and C2, and we multiply them respectively by a vector Y1 and Y2. Um, you see the first vector y1 is 101 divided by square root of two. The second vector is one, zero of one zero. And um, second vector describes well the virus state of the second node and the first vector of the first node and the third node. And um, the scaling with uh, square root two is done to have um, a unit length vector. Um, and y1 and y2 are, are orthogonal to each other. And um, on the right, you see a ge geometric picture of that. So you see the blue arrows are y1 and y2. And they span this blue shaded region, which is the invariant set. And um, if i0 lies on that set, then we stay on that set at every time. So if I try to sketch the um, state trajectory in PowerPoint, um, it's, it's supposed to be on the blue shaded region. Um, yeah, that's just what I just said. It's, it stays in the span of these two vectors, the virus state. And um, the underlying reason is that uh, the matrix vector product of the infection rate matrix and the virus state vector stays in the subspace. Um, technically speaking, this, this, this subspace X is, um, is an invariant subspace of the matrix B. And um, and you can see that 
by looking at the infection rate matrix. So the first part is just um, writing down the infection rate matrix of the path graph, which we had in the previous slide. Um, but you can do a change of basis and then you obtain this matrix. Um, you see that any um, any vector that's in the, in the span of these two vectors will, in the end, also stay in the span of these two vectors. Um, yeah, that's the underlying reason in the end. But that's just the motivation, and we want to be a bit more general. Um, this concept is known as proper orthogonal decomposition, so that's not a new concept here. The application to network science, to my knowledge, knowledge is, but um, if anyone knows, please let me know. Um, so in, in general, now we approximate the viral state by a linear combination of vegetation modes YL weighted by a scalar function CLC. And the difference to before is that we don't have two agitation modes, but N, and um, we approximate in terms of exact description. And um, we come back to that sometimes. So also put it here on the whiteboard. Um, and because these vectors are vectors YL are orthonormal, we can obtain the scalar scalar CL of T by projecting the virus state onto the agitation modes YL. And the main idea of this, this thing, the main power comes into play is that uh, can come into play um, by reducing now the, the dimensionality of the, of the ODE. Um, our starting point was, was N that branch expression. Um, F SIS is just now the right hand side of the SIS expression. And if you suppose now that the POD is um, accurate, so this, this approximation is accurate. And you can replace the virus state on the right hand side of the POD. And you obtain the derivative of the, of the um, projections by projecting the right hand side on the agitation mode. And then we have only M differential equations. So if the POD is indeed accurate, then this is a very nice result um, to use. Um, but uh, maybe no, no, the, the challenging part is we don't have the Agitation modes. So why L is, is unknown for the path graph? We could somewhat read it, but here it's a bit more open um, for general complex graphs. And um, in general, we, like, one can obtain the agitation modes numerically um, by observing the virus state for some time. So consider that the small n observations are done at the spacing delta t. Um, and we can define the observation matrix by just stacking the viral state observations next to each other. So it's a uh, capital N by N observation matrix. And um, well, we can make use of, of the single value distribution. Um, the observation matrix equals the outer product of UL, which, is, which are the left single vectors, times uh, the L transpose, the right single vectors. Times sigma L, which are the, uh, the singular values. So that's that's nothing new. That's linear algebra, and you can um, truncate it at n. So you only take the n largest singular vector, uh, singular values. Um, and this actually tells us this approximation that the columns of O, so U L, is a column vector. That they're um, and they're, they're, they're given, um, sorry, the columns of, we have to go to the left side, the columns of O, which are the virus state vectors, they're approximated by the right side of the UL times VL, so a linear combination of the um, left singular vectors. And um, in the end, we, what we're saying is that, that the optimal agitation modes YL equal to the left singular vectors, so the U. One to U n, um, an optimal in the sense of the Euclidean norm. Um, and here I put also to that's again it's nothing new. These snapshot matrix in obtaining the agitation modes, um, but I think it's quite crucial to repeat here. 
And um, let me now evaluate this, this, this approach on epidemics for epidemics on networks. Um, yeah, please. Because um, in the example of the bar graph, you sort of mentioned how vegetation modes came in play because of the matrix B. Mm -hmm. But here you're getting it more from observations. So are those two options to do the same thing, or I'm just you don't know that you can do that. For the path graph, you would, if you start on the invariant set, you would, with that method, you would obtain the same vegetation modes. Yeah. Um, in general, linking linking these vegetation modes that are obtained numerically to the structure, mm -hmm. it's not easy because it depends just on the initial state. If um, so, so you can think in general that the network has some structure, um, equitable partitions, for example, mm -hmm. and if your initial state is aligned with that. Then this should give you uh, the agitation modes of okay. the structure. Um, yeah, but this is a bit more general. So sometimes you would merge merge two cells of equitable partition into, into one agitation mode because they're not really numerically not, not visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now to move to actually back, back to uh, epidemics on networks, um, we have here now. The virus state trace of um, FAS epidemics on Vera Albert um, graph with 500 nodes. And um, I only plotted six of them because otherwise it would be a bit too overlapping. And in blue, you see the exact virus state. And in red, you see the POD obtained numerically as before. And now with only three agitation nodes. Um, and you see it's very actual. It's um, barely visible, uh, so I cannot see any difference. Um, it's quite a contrast of it's, it's 500 nodes to three agitation modes. And um, well, there's a small application to the real data of, uh, of the COVID-19 outbreak um, in 2020. Here we only have 12 provinces in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, again, approximated their cumulative infection curve um, by only three agitation modes. And also here it's quite actual. Um, Maybe more or less impressive. I don't know, but we have much fewer nodes, but much noisier data. Sorry. Yeah. Can you estimate an error on the red point? Um, yes, I, can. I don't have the error here, but um, yeah, it's, it's all. Yeah, especially if you increase the trace, if you increase M. Um, because the underlying reason is that the similar values. They drop exponentially quick. So if you have yeah, one more agitation node, it's a multiplicative factor on your accuracy. So the number of uh, singular values you keep is the number of agitation nodes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that's um, up to the user mm -hmm. to decide how much. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, it looks because somehow you're, you're looking at nonlinear dynamics, right? So it's not obvious that singular values work. But no, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's somewhat of a hybrid. Uh, I, I like to call it a hybrid of linear and nonlinear uh, approach because it's linear combination, but CP are nonlinear. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not. Um, I also don't have a full explanation. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting to research more. Yeah. yeah. So when you uh, find the repetition box with the and then, if you look at the at the singular vector, I guess you can find back to which mode corresponds to which nodes in the in the, in the original graph. Um, not necessarily. So, an an um, an agitation mode may have many nodes present, many yeah, nodes. Different. So, and. Yeah, there is the, the link. So if we have equitable partitions, some structure, then we see it in agitation modes. But agitation modes is more general. So we have also for non or for BA graphs, which may not be that highly structured. Um, we can have the reverse. So we see structure in the dynamics and agitation modes, and it's not clear how that translates to the structure in, 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 uh, in the graph. Well, I think one way to see what we're doing is a kind of uh, uh, clustering based on the dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we were, that's actually a good point. If we were to simulate 
Um, I, I think the, the crucial point is that we have only one one initial condition. So quite often, quite many papers generate more and more curves, and then they see that the agitation mode structure exactly matches the graph structure. Um, but in epidemics, it may not always be feasible because, well, we sadly have only one pandemic to observe, um, no, luckily. And um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and then we have to somehow yeah fill in the gap. And the initials, yeah, and basically you, that, that's another thing. If you want to have really match it exactly. For, um, from vegetation mode structure to structure and graph, you need um, to observe more and more initial conditions, more and more outbreaks, the larger your graph is. So, it's, so the scaling is somehow, if you consider n towards infinity, it's, at some point it's not really feasible. Um, no. So I suppose the, the clusters that you get wouldn't really be clusters in the sense of things being close together. They'd be more like things that behave similarly. Yes. Yeah. Given that particular initial condition, yeah. So. Okay, and um, now we try to apply this agitation mode system because um, right now we just have some observation that's cool, but there are some 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 nice results that follow from that. Um, okay, that's just a repetition. We have that on the whiteboard. Um, but if we want to predict epidemics, the, the challenge, as mentioned before, is that the Tree infection rate matrix is unknown. And common good approach, I guess, is to use an estimate to get of the infection rate matrix. Um, and now we try to actually see how, how does the, this, this observed agitation mode um, uh, structure, how, how does it come into play here? Um, so, yeah, suppose POD is separate with order M. Um, and we just plug that into the differential equations. And we see that that now the, the only product that occurs between matrix and the vector of our state vectors is this at the very right, B times I of T. Um, so if B hat times the sum equals B times the sum, then we will predict accurately. Um, but now the B times I of T is, is, is um, equals to B hat times I of T if B, if, if the agitation, the matrix vector product of B and the agitation mode is the same. Um, does it make sense how we, how we get to it? Um, okay, if that condition holds, then we can expect to predict accurately. But, um, well, you could think now a nice and a linear set of equations, it's easy. Well, it is not <laughs> underdetermined. Um, and we have n squared variables for the unknown B hat. But only m times n linear equations. So we have n linear equations and a vector equations with n entries with very few agitation modes. So yeah, three versus 500. And as a result of this underdetermination, we have numerous estimates that result in the same dynamics as, as B. And um, yeah, just quickly, we have a yeah, very basic algorithm that we call the network inference. Based prediction algorithm um, that, that builds up on this observation. Um, observation. As input, we take um, first state observations, p until times p is two. Then we infer uh, a network estimate, p hat, that has the same um, interplay with agitation modes. And we have a, have a lasso or an L1 norm regularization term here. Um, and as a side note, it can be interpreted as a Bayesian estimate given a prior that's this exponential, which may not be, be accurate, to be honest, but the maximum likelihood interpretation surely is, is possible. Um, and given this estimate, we have, we now plug in the, the observed value state at the time t equals two, we simulate uh, forward. And um, it's, uh, now just an um, illustration. The red circles are the predicted ones, and the blue ones are the true viral states. Blue corresponds to the true network, red corresponds to the best edit method. Um, yeah, a small performance evaluation of this, this um, algorithm. Um, we use the real world network with face to face contacts. Um, 
some of you may, may know this uh, infectious stay away exhibition where face-to-face -face connections between visitors were measured um, with the idea that well face-to-face -face contacts they result potentially in often infection from one individual to, individual to another and um, we simulate on that network now an SAS network. And yeah, this is basically the result. So the blue curve is a pure viral state, and we observe it until here. And then we plug, uh, we, we estimate the head and obtain the red um, prediction on the estimated network. Again, only for some viral state curves. Um, so the prediction here is quite, quite accurate. It does deviate for towards 0 0.5, but I think it's still still a good um, accuracy. And the main question is now, well, maybe natural to ask now, does this accuracy of prediction imply an accuracy of reconstruction? And you can already imagine that it doesn't. Um, because we, well, network science, of course, wants to compare networks with topological networks. And um, here we've used, on the one hand, ADC score, the um, Area under the curve score, um, which is, I think, I have an explanation here. Yeah. A value between zero and one. One means perfect reconstruction, and 0 0.5 means that basically you were to reconstruct by tossing a, a, um, a coin for every possible possible link. And um, yeah, the AUC is very close to 0 0.5. So practically, we didn't really uh, reconstruct anything. And another picture is the integrated distribution, log log scale. Um, red is now the um, curve network, and blue is the, um, the true network. So it's, it's hard to compare. Um, yeah. um, so thinking now, it seems like maybe there's a little more hope for your AUC. So how are you dealing with node identification between the two networks? Because mm -hmm. nodes don't have labels in the model right or uh, i guess they, they haven't have, they, they, they have an index but yes it's, it's a good point so you mean if, if maybe there's symmetry if, like maybe a measure of isomorphism would be better than um, just looking at specific links it's a good point but i think it's not necessary because in the end we do know we do map the observations to specific nodes mm -hmm. um so, uh, so if we were to rotate that then we were also to rotate i to i bar or something like another Vector. I'm, I'm not sure if, if there may be symmetries that, yeah, I'm not, 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 not maybe, I, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, not a very clear isomorphism, just a plain one. Um, yeah, but that, that's a good comment. Um, okay, but even the, the in-degree distribution, I think that's, that doesn't match at, at all. Um, and um, yeah, this is the summary slide now of this first part. Uh, accurate prediction, inaccurate reconstruction. We can predict accurately without the topology. Um, and the underlying reason is, is that this DOD is accurate, but the viral state dynamics are, are very agitated. Um, and we did try that for different models. So other epidemic compartment models, but also um, population dynamics or or gene regulatory dynamics on neural firing. We basically yeah, had similar ODEs and tried out what, what um, this prediction algorithm would do. Okay, that's, that's the first part of the talk. Um, a way of time, I think I skipped to the first subsection here, where I just maybe highlight um, the main results. So for this subsection, we consider basically we want to move now from the agitation mode set to numerically, we want to do a bit more analytics and see if we can actually find agitation modes from the from the um, differential equations. And yes, we can <laughs> actually um, for the complete graph here and homogeneous rates and um, well infection matrix and constant. Um, for this graph, we have only two agitation modes. Um, well, okay, I think this, just look at the blue box maybe. So basically we have, we can find two agitation modes 
y1 and y2 such that the TOT is accurate for only two um, for, the, for only these two agitation modes, regardless of how, how large the complete graph is. Um, and based on this decomposition that's accept, we can also solve the SIS equation on the complete graph for, for, for any uh, for any initial, initial condition. Um, if you, of course, start with the same initial condition on the whole graph, well, then it's practically a one dimensional um, uh, evolution, but even with different initial conditions, we have only a two dimensional solution. Um, yeah. Uh, do the cell groups here have an, an epidemiolog epidemiological meaning, or um, does, does the math work without the cell groups? Do you know? So it does not work without the cell groups. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. You could interpret this as, as an upper bound, or yeah. um, well, or if you have a, have a group based interpretation, then you're saying, well, that's it's just because the infection rate matrix is constant. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I like the result. Um, just, just that's why I, I just want to show it. But um, I think numerically, um, it's, it's quite nice to see that the agitation modes correspond to such, such a meaning in the dynamics. Um, so here we just plot three nodes on the complete graph. Um, each curve and different node. Um, on the left, we have the viral state, and on the right, we have the projections of this viral state onto the um, vegetation modes. And um, the black curve is the projection of the viral state on the first agitation mode, which is constant. So, uh, constant across i, it's just the, the mean. And the other three curves, the color three curves, they are um, the projection of the virus state um, onto the second agitation mode, and of that, the first, second, and third component. Um, and basically, you see how this, this dynamics on the left, how it decomposes into well, the mean, the, the black curve, and um, the color curves, the, the, the deviation of the mean that converges to zero. Um, so for the complete graph, it's quite, quite nice to see that agitation modes have a meaning. Um, an intuitive meaning. Um, I rushed a bit with that section, but basically that's uh, the main result I want to show. Um, because the, the complete graph was, of course, a bit maybe too simple to be really be a complex network. That's why we now move to more uh, complicated networks. Um, yeah, again, a recap. The POD is accurate for complicated networks topologies as well, and we only need m differential equations for the scalars. Um, okay, but even if we have only m, if m is equals two, three, four, still seems quite hard to solve generally this this, this coupled uh, set of differential equations. Um, so luckily, we made the, the observation that there's in fact only one agitation mode. Um, around the epidemic threshold. So around the epidemic threshold, when I say that, I mean, I'm not as close to one. And um, only one agitation mode means that the IFT is approximated by one scalar times one constant vector. Um, that's, I think, quite surprising. Um, if we have here an example with, with two nodes, so we have two dimensions, and the black curve is now state trajectory starting at some small initial condition. Um, blue, the blue arrow is the state, and the red arrow now is a multiple of the state. So we're pointing in the same direction. Um, and we see that here for R0 much larger than one, the viral state trajectory is quite far away from this red curve. But as, as we move towards one, um, the virus state trajectory is squeezed, so to say, around the, around the um, blue curve. Um, so this just to give a geometric understanding, but um, so we, so we'll get a bit more concrete. Um, okay, basically, so the main, main thing is in the blue box again. Um, if you have this observation that there's only one agitation mode, then you can derive an approximation. We have here I approximation of T, which is some scalar, or that is just a scalar function 
as the vector i infinity. And uh, as, as, as a recall, or, um, reminder, that's the second stage function. So start as minus one, go to one. And we shift it basically by one and divide it by two. So all this term in front of i infinity is between zero and one. Um, the scale right here, the this one, this captures the, the um, initial condition somehow. Um, and W is also in closed form. Um, w turns out speed and convergence towards I infinity is just before T in the equation. Um, and that, that consists of, of known quantities. So we have five plots. We have the curing rates with X1. X1 is the principal eigenvector of the next generation matrix. And um, the relation to R0 here is that the next generation matrix times the principal eigenvector equals R0 times um, principal eigenvector. Um, any, any question to that formula? I think the, the main part is that we have a closed form expression, <coughs> scalar um, C of T times I infinity. Yeah. How close does it have to be to one for this to be an idea? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. <laughs> because, um, yeah, I mean, it's nice to have an approximation, but it's an approximation is only nice uh, if you know something about the accuracy. That's exactly the next slide. Um, and this is a uniform convergence result. Um, it, it relies on some assumptions. Um, I, I only include the main assumptions. I, in my understanding, they're technical assumptions. We need to make a few more, which I don't mention here. Um, but I think the main assumptions that, that I should mention should, is that the infection rate matrix is symmetric and it's irreducible. So we have an undirected and connected graph. And the second assumption is that we have a small spiral state um, initially. So the initial condition i of zero is, is bounded by r naught minus one squared times some, that's not a singular value now, it's uh, should have chosen another notation, but sigma one is some constant. Um, the main result now is that we can bound this approximation error. So I of the exact value state and I approximation is the well, approximation of the previous slide. And the two norm error now is bounded by some constant times R naught minus one squared. And that at every time T. And um, yeah, we have a small illustration here. So basically, if we start, we start at, at the disk with radius um, R0 to minus one squared. And um, well, and of course, I, I of zero should be having positive components. And as long as we start there, we stay in, inside this tunnel around steady state. And the width of the tunnel is R0 minus one squared. So um, the, the smaller the, uh, the smaller the difference of R naught to one, the thinner the tunnel gets, and um, uh, we, we can get arbitrarily close. Um, yeah, that's basically the main result. And uh, to show you an evaluation with uh, again a barbasic other network, two hundred nodes. Um, this is now the blue curve. The exact solution and the red curve is the approximation for R0 equals 1.01. So we, we, we see we, here we don't see really a difference. If we increase R0 to 1.5 or 2, we see um, deviations, especially around the, the middle part of um, the intermediate values of T. They do naturally, they do, um, for large T, we convert to the steady state. Both the approximation and the exact solution in which to the same steady state. Um, but, but for intermediate times, we have uh, yeah, um, an approximation error. Yeah, so I summarize it here for relatively large R0, um, depends on the application, uh, the approximations axis. And um, the regime around R0 equals one can be epidemi epidemiologically quite interesting. If we um, look at COVID, for example, we saw that the effective reproduction number was always close to one. So 
taking into account time varying lockdown measures and restrictions, um, it somehow was oscillating around, around one, which is very different, of course, than to, to COVID spreading freely without any lockdown measures. Um, And a small remark on the on general initial state. So we, we assume here that I of zero was in this disk of radius I not minus one squared. But natural question to ask is what if the, the initial virus state is not small? Um, and I don't have an answer to that other than plots. But uh, here I generated the initial virus state to be um, uniformly between zero and I infinity. And um, these plots show the same curve, curve only if here the time goes until 110 and here the time goes until two. So that's the right plot zooms in on this um, part of the dynamics. And a very interesting thing um, is that the, the exact solution now converges very rapidly to the uh, one dimensional approximation, um, which here almost looks like a vertical drop. Um, here you see it's smooth on, on a smaller time scale. Um, yeah, I don't have, a, have an explanation yet for, for that um, analytically, but um, the approximation seems to be quite, quite nice also for, um, for general states. And the last point. Uh, so if we work further with this one dimensionality of, uh, of the spread around the threshold, um, the very nice application is that we can reduce in, the influence of the contact path on the surface. Now. So on the left, you have an arbitrary contact path. You have the gene spreading rates and um, so during rates and infection rates and some initial virus state. And now the, the result is that as this I mark goes to one, that we can basically reduce what the spread, the spread on the left graph to the spread on the right graph, which is easy. The right graph has homogeneous spreading rates, um, delta tilde, beta tilde, and self-infection rates, which may be now different for different things. There's beta tilde IR, and all these spreading rates have explicit um, expression. Um, and the main result now is that if we start with the same initial condition with i tilde of zero equals i of zero, then this approximation error. So the left, the epidemic on the left graph evolves the same as an epidemic on the right graph if or not is, is, is sufficiently close to one. Um, and the, the reason is that the only influence, influence on the graph structure, you can summarize in one sentence of it, um, the influence on the graph structure in the left. Um, it's only given by the principal eigenvector of the next generation matrix. And by construction, um, the right graph has the, has the same principal eigenvector, which is basically tuned by these um, self infection rates. Um, and the, the result is similar to, to the previous one. Um, that's one more plot. Um, comparing now. This result. Um, so we have a Aravasi Albert graph with 100 nodes and a complete graph and homogeneous rates. And well, this, this is the result we get that we um, have here now the blue curves now correspond to the Aravasi Albert graph, and the red circles are it's, it's, it's the same virus as the virus state initialized at, at the same condition, but on the complete graph <coughs> from the previous slide. And um, Left subplot is R not equals 1.01, where we see that, well, it does still diverge. It's not quite accurate here. Um, so for R not equals 1.001, really close to the threshold, um, you, get a, you get a good approximation accuracy. So this result may be more um, less applicable, I would say, yeah, a bit less applicable. But um, I think it's a nice. Uh, observation that the, the structure does not really have an influence. And that concludes my talk. Um, so 
in a nutshell, we have complicated networks that may be large and heterogeneous. Um, but in contrast, we have simple biodynamic symbol in the way that we have very few agitation modes of, in the uh, um, proper covenant decomposition. And even more, when, when R0 is close to 1, the um, epidemic of, on a heterogeneous network basically reduces to an epidemic on a homogeneous network. And methodologically, I think the agitation mode approach is quite interesting to discover low dimensional structures and high dimensional data. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, please, any questions? Thank you, thanks for your talk. Uh, we've had a few questions during uh, the talk already, but if anyone either in the room or online still has questions. Um, yeah, um, could you talk a little bit, excuse me, more about um, the network inference part? You said that it can be interpreted as a Bayesian estimate with an exponential prior. Do you yeah. have you thought of ways to do a better network inference there? Uh, um, no, I haven't. And, and um, honestly, that also follows quite quite well known arguments. So I'm, I'm not claiming that this is my uh, my work. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the the um, if you have the one because the lasso is composed of the two norm minimization plus a one norm part. Mm -hmm. The two norm minimization or two norm term is basically the deviation of model of its observation uh, at noise. Mm -hmm. And the second part, the one norm minimization, that would basically be the exponential prior. Um, yeah, that's in the end, um, I think the interesting part that we don't even have to specify the prior to, to predict accurately. Um, and I think there's this probably um, a limit because in the end, you don't want to um, and for your network actually because of prior, but the, the question is how much is in the data that you observe. Um, yeah, but certainly you can invest with that. In this case, right, you, you, by only looking at the IFT, you, mm -hmm. if you, like in the simulations, you did know the network structure, but you've thrown yeah. it out and looked at the IFT, but in the real world, you would only have the IFT, so yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Doesn't look like. So thank you again. Oh, great. Uh, it always can. Um, like I said, there's one more. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I I have not thought of that. So, so the question is if we could take into account the dynamics of the network within this framework. And it's true, I, I assume the constant network and in reality, contact patterns change over time, um, um, which I haven't considered here. And I, I think basically there are two um, frameworks to consider that. On the one hand, we could have that the, the adjacency matrix follows a similar description as here. So that we have some, uh, maybe something like this, that D, beta, ij, of T V T, which equals some some model, and then the question is if, if, if these dynamics are not also low dimensional if we apply the POD on the infection rate. Um, yeah, that, that's all I, I start with. Um, but I think it's interesting to explore. 